Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Uh, Nathan mentioned Dave would be speaking. He also mentioned that there were four young men who, who taught in, in uh, VBS. So I don't know if he was talking about you as one of those or not, Dave, but just uh, something we might need to ask him afterwards. Let's open in prayer. Uh, we'll be studying uh, the book of Philippians, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, an overview uh, of that, that, uh, that book as a whole. We'll also be digging into um, the first six verses, but let's go ahead and open in prayer before we uh, open the word. Father, we thank you for this morning, and uh, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you um, that you have revealed truth to us. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to study it, and we ask that you speak to us. Speak to our hearts. We pray that we'd be open to you and uh, that your message would be clear this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we've uh, we've concluded our study on the uh, Paul's epistles to the Ephesians as well as the Colossians, both of which he wrote from prison. And uh, we're now engaging now in a study of the book of Philippians, which he also wrote from prison. Um, I have, uh, in my personal memory, etched from early in my life, uh, my first memory of this book, uh, the church I was going to at the time, I was probably about seven or eight, uh, there was one of, our, one of our Awana leaders had memorized the entire book, all four chapters of, of Philippians. And so one Sunday morning he stood up in front of the church and uh, he wore a uh, sort of biblical time style tunic and he had chains on his hands and on his feet and he quoted the whole thing. Um, so that, that left an impression on me. I, I don't think he was word perfect. I remember he, he needed a couple helps, but that was pretty amazing. Um, so this morning, we'll be, uh, we'll be looking at three things. We'll be looking at uh, what we know about the city of Philippi from Scripture as well as uh, some historical background. And I think this will be helpful for us from a contextual standpoint uh, as we begin to study the, the, uh, the letter as a whole. Secondly, this morning, we'll look at some of the key themes in the book, um, some of the the main thoughts that Paul shares, and uh, lastly, we'll begin our actual in-depth verse-by-verse study, so we'll be covering the first six verses of chapter one. So um, let's start off with uh, the first part, just looking at what we know about Philippi and the, the context of Paul's interaction with that city. So. I'm showing right now a map, um, and this map right now is depicting what is, uh, what is termed Paul's first missionary journey, the first missionary journey, which he began in Antioch, uh, and he went out. He, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He was a gospel pioneer. He was, uh, he was one that God used to bring the gospel message to places where it had never been brought before. And so in his first journey, He traveled through um, uh, the regions, the biblical times regions of Pamphylia and Galatia, which you can see on the map here. He visited a number of cities there. He he preached the gospel. Um, He saw individuals saved. He established uh, New Testament churches in these areas. And uh, and then he returned to to Antioch. Uh, This area that he visited was in the modern uh, modern, uh, day country of Turkey. Now, moving on to his second missionary journey, um, he began this second journey by revisiting some of those uh, same places that he visited on the first journey. So you can see that he again went to the city of of Derbe, the city of Lystra, there in that green section in the area of Galatia. And um, we read in Acts 16 that he visited these places and uh, that his purpose in visiting, uh, revisiting these places was to strengthen and encourage these brand new churches that were established as well as to deliver some instructions from uh, the apostles and the elders in the church in Jerusalem. Some instructions that had come out of a council there that was on the topic of whether uh, Gentile believers in Jesus needed to observe the Jewish law. So having visited these, uh, these cities that he'd been to before, um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to pick up on the account in Acts chapter 16. So let's turn with me, please, this morning to Acts chapter 16. And we're going to re- read the historical narrative, according to Scripture, of Paul's journey westward. Let's read verse 5 of Acts 16. 
So the churches, speaking of those in Derby and Lystra, were strengthened in faith and increased in number daily. So Paul has finished this strengthening exercises, and now he and his companions feel the urge to go deeper with the gospel, to go further into these regions which had never been reached with the gospel. Uh, He wanted to go further west. He wanted to go further north. Let's continue. Verse 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. You can see on the map this red region of Asia here. Uh, there are some cities in there that we'll recognize. Ephesus. He eventually uh, visited Ephesus and preached the gospel there and established churches there. You see other cities that are ultimately mentioned in the book of Revelation, the seven churches. Um, but at this time, the Holy Spirit was not leading Paul to go visit those cities in Asia right now at this time. He was forbidden to, by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. I love this account. Uh, I, I think it's very personal for us in our lives as we think about um, if you're here this morning and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus, you've probably asked the question in your life, what is God's will for me? What does he want me to do? I wish he would tell me what his will is for my life. And maybe uh, as a young person especially, you, you, um, you wrestle with that question. And here we see an account of the Apostle Paul, a follower of Jesus, probably wondering the same thing. But what we don't see in the life of Paul, we don't see him saying, I'm going to sit back and just wait. I'm just going to sit back on my haunches and wait until I have a vision from heaven on where to go next. No, he was actually going. He said, I'm going to keep going as I continue to seek the leadership of the Lord, the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And as he was In the process of taking a step, the Holy Spirit directed and guided him to the exact place he needed to go. And he literally did receive a sign from heaven. This vision of this man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. Macedonia, you can see, is in the upper left-hand corner of the map here. And it is uh, the region in which Philippi, the city of Philippi, is located. Uh, Let's continue. Verse 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city in that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. Uh, Now, I hadn't realized until I I really started looking at this map and studying for this message, um, this is... uh, this is pretty monumental because it's the first time recorded in Scripture, recorded in history, that the gospel has gone into the continent of Europe. Philippi is the first European city. It's in the, it's in the northern region of modern-day Greece. The first European city to receive the gospel. Um, so I'd never thought about that before, but that's pretty amazing. Um, we're, we're reading here about the first time the gospel goes into, into Greece, into uh, the continent of Europe. All right, so we'll leave off there in Acts 16, and uh, we're just going to go through kind of a quick overview of some other things we know about Philippi, um, things that happened according to, uh, to the book of Acts and other uh, epistles. Um, if we were to continue to read on in Acts 16, we would find right away that uh, Lydia, who is a, uh, an entrepreneur, she's a seller of purple, Um, She receives the gospel. She's the first recorded convert uh, in the city of of Philippi. And um, so we see the conversion of Lydia and her family um, uh, happening in in Philippi through the the ministry of Paul. As we continue to read uh, the book of Acts, chapter 16, we find out that Paul casts out a demon uh, from this young woman who is uh, in, in bondage. She's in slavery. She actually has a master, an owner, and she is, she is demon, 
uh, oppressed, and she um, is, is receiving spiritual ability to, uh, to do fortune telling, that sort of thing, and uh, producing lots of uh, financial profit for her master. But Paul casts out the demon and um, ends up getting thrown into prison. And uh, we, I'm sure we're, we're familiar with the account of, of Paul and Silas being cast into prison, um, his account there, the account there involving the Philippian jailer. Um, but isn't it isn't interesting. We, we talked about the fact that God made his will for Paul very clear in saying, you're to go into Macedonia. And we see right from the get-go, we see spiritual success. We see the gospel taking root and the, the, the person of Lydia receiving the gospel. But we also see right away uh, Paul experiencing suffering, Paul experiencing uh, persecution. So um, as, we, as we glean from Scripture and we allow Scripture to teach us the truth, we see that God's will for our lives doesn't always mean ease. It doesn't always mean comfort. It doesn't always mean financial prosperity or good health. It involves prison. It involves suffering. And in fact, as we get into uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, he actually says in chapter 1, he tells the Philippian believers in verse, one, uh, in verse 29, he says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's been granted to you to suffer for his sake. It's a gift. It's an honor. It's a privilege. And we see that in Paul's life, and we see that in his teaching. All right. Um, so, yes, Paul and Silas get cast into prison. Uh, we know the story. They sing. They pray while they're in prison after being beaten. And uh, the Lord performs an amazing miracle. There's an earthquake. The prison doors fly open. And this additional character, the Philippian jailer, we're introduced to. He, his, his response, he thinks that the, the prisoners have escaped. Um, he's going to be uh, uh, severely punished, probably the death penalty from uh, the, the magistrates there. So he's about to kill himself. And, uh, and Paul says, no, 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 don't harm yourself. We're still here. And uh, that, famous, that famous verse I'm sure we're all fam uh, familiar with, the, the jailer comes in trembling and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Philipp uh, Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So I'm glad that that account is in there, and I'm glad that the Philippian jailer was, uh, was saved uh, through the ministry of Paul and th in the outcome of this imprisonment and suffering that Paul experienced. Um, that's about it in terms of the, the biblical account that we'll cover this morning. Um, the city of Philippi was repeatedly visited by both Paul and Silas individually. Sorry, Paul and, and Timothy individually. Um, so he did go back after that initial visit. And, um, and the, the city of Philippi, or the area of Macedonia, is mentioned as many as five, five additional epistles. And uh, many of those mentions have to do with the generosity of the Philippian believers. Um, the generosity of the Philippian be uh, believers. If we turn to Romans chapter 15, verse 26, it's one example of these, uh, these mentions of Philippi. Uh, Paul is, is uh, writing to the, to the Romans, obviously, in this epistle. But in chapter 15, verse 26, it says, For it pleased those from Macedonia, that's, that's the area of Philippi, and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Um, so we see mentioned there that the, the Philippian believers made a contribution to other believers in another area, all the way down in Jerusalem, um, who, were, who were in the process of suffering. Um, and then another, just uh, another thought around the generosity of the Philippian believers. Uh, actually, in Philippians chapter 4, 15, Paul gives them a, a commendation. He says, You Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no other church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. So, um, this, uh, this group of believers had a distinction. They were distinguished in Paul's eyes as being those who were generous and those who were not only uh, receiving the benefit of salvation and having been saved themselves, but also contributing to the ministry of the evangelism of Paul, the, the ministry of the gospel in a financial way. Uh, just in terms of historical background, uh, Philippi was uh, a, a major Greek city. It became a Roman colony around uh, B.C. 47, and uh, it was uh, based on archaeological evidence. It, it contained gold mines, um, so that could speak to the financial prosperity that allowed the Philippian believers to be generous, um, which, which they chose to do of their own volition. 
Um, it also contained a Roman theater. All right, so that's the background uh, that we know about the city of Philippi, uh, the context of Paul's interaction with them. And now we're going to take a few minutes to, um, to just take a quick survey and look at some of the overarching themes that are found in the actual letter of Philippians that Paul wrote. Um, so uh, in, in preparing for this and studying for this, um, apparently there are a number of commentators that like to refer to Philippians as Paul's thank you letter. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of cute. It's kind of cute term. Um, and there's no question that, uh, that he does express his thanks for their contribution, right? Um, but obviously, this is a Holy Spirit-inspired um, uh, writing, and there's much more to it than, than Paul directing uh, thanks to the believers there, although he definitely does uh, exhibit his gratitude. Um, and in fact, when we look at Scripture itself, we see that when, when Paul expresses his thanksgiving, his gratitude, he does it, the, the direction of that thanksgiving is to God specifically. It's not to the individual uh, believers there. If we look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, uh, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. So that's one example of him expressing his thanksgiving directed to the Lord. All right, another uh, theme that we see throughout the, uh, the epistle is that we, we see that this epistle, this letter is very positive. It's very upbeat. Um, many of Paul's letters contained a fair bit of correction, uh, a fair bit of negative admonition to whatever church he was writing to. Um, this one is, is very positive. There's, there's very little in, in terms of negative an, uh, admonition directed towards the believers in Philippi. And um, I believe that's a, a testament to just the great start that they had uh, and their faithfulness. Um, but in, this, in, in regards to this idea of positive and, and upbeat, um, the words joy and the words rejoice, th those two words um, occur no less than 12 times throughout the, um, the pages of the book of Ephi uh, Philippians. So um, one example that we could look, look at would be in chapter 1, verse 18. Um, Paul is talking about his imprisonment. He's talking about his... Um, his persecution. And uh, he says, in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. So here's Paul. He's in prison. He's suffering persecution. And yet what's his response? He's rejoicing. He's joyful because uh, Christ is being preached. The gospel is being furthered. And so a question, an internal question for us as we evaluate scripture, is our life characterized by joy? Is it characterized by rejoicing? There's, there's a lot of trouble around us. There's a lot of uh, turmoil that's happening in the world. Um, but are, is our life grounded in the person of Christ and his work on the cross in a way that leads to rejoicing and leads, uh, uh, leads to joy in our lives, regardless of how difficult the, the, the human circumstances we find ourselves may be? All right, uh, as we continue, uh, some other themes in uh, the book to the Philippians. When we study Colossians, uh, I believe it was Conrad mentioned the fact that uh, it's not believed that Paul ever visited the city of Colossae, even though he wrote a letter to them. Um, in contrast, as we, as we read the pages of Philippians, we see um, that Paul had a very special connection with these believers. It's very personal. Uh, his writing is, is a very, very personal theme to it. Um, in chapter 1, verse 7, he tells them, you are in my heart. Um, you are in my heart. In verse 8, he says, I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 19, he tells them that I'm going to be sending Timothy to you so that I can be encouraged by learning about how you're doing. And um, Timothy was a very close co-worker to Paul. That would have been a great sacrifice for him being in prison to send Timothy away from himself for who knows how many months just to go find out how the Philippian believers were doing. So Paul really loved these believers. He really cared about them. Um, in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, My brethren, dearly beloved and longed for my joy and crown. So it's really, I think it's really beautiful to see how much Paul loved these believers um, and it was willing to express that. And um, again, as a, as, as a way of reflecting in our own lives, do we have that same, sort of, um, that, sa that same sort of love for one another, that same sort of affection 
um, in, amongst the family of God, whether it be uh, those of us here at, 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 this, uh, at this one assembly, this local assembly in Lander Lakes, um, or whether it be those who we've shared the gospel with elsewhere, per, perhaps who we've led, led to the Lord. Uh, do we continue to, to carry that affection and that love um, for our family in the Lord? Um, throughout Philippians, another theme that definitely comes out strongly is the emphasis, a strong emphasis on the gospel. A strong emphasis on the gospel. In the, in the first chapter alone, uh, I believe that Paul mentions the gospel five times. And um, we, we already talked about the fact that he's in prison, that he's suffering, uh, but that he's happy, that he's rejoicing in the fact that, uh, that Christ is being preached. Let's look at verse 12 of chapter 1. And uh, a few weeks ago, we had, um, we had a, a brother, um, um, uh, Tom, Tom Carvalho's uh, brother, share with us from this, air, from this section of, of Scripture. But he really emphasized verse 12. I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Furtherance of the gospel. So we see uh, Paul's heart, his passion, his zeal for the gospel come out as a theme in, uh, in the book of Philippians. And again, as we continue to uh, think about what's written in the, um, in the scriptures, what's written in this letter, um, again, a question of reflection for our own lives. Do we carry a zeal? Do you carry a zeal for the gospel in your life uh, and in the lives of those who you are involved with? Um, or have we grown stale? Has, has our, our love and our zeal for the gospel, has it been um, uh, extinguished to some extent? And uh, definitely thankful for the week of VBS and all the effort that went into the preaching of the gospel during that week. But as we look at our own lives, is, is the gospel, is the message uh, exuding from our life on an ongoing basis? Are we looking for those opportunities on a daily basis, uh, those doors of opportunity that the Holy Spirit is opening up? Okay, uh, in a number of places in the book of Philippians, Paul uh, really talks about the surpassing value of Christ, the value of knowing Christ, of having Christ, of being with Christ. Um, in the latter part of chapter 1, uh, he talks about, you know, in the wake of being in this, uh, this, uh, this state of, of pr imprisonment, this state of suffering, uh, this state of uncertainty where he's not sure what's going to happen next. Maybe he's going to be put to death for his faith. Um, he says, look, uh, let's, let's, look, let's read in, in verse 21 of chapter 1. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that's an amazing, amazing statement. Um, that if you're sitting here this morning and you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been born again, you've become his child, we don't have to fear death. In fact, not only do we not fear death, but if we die, we win. <laughs> if we die, we win. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. He says it's actually better. He said if I live on in the flesh, it will mean fruit for my labor, which is important. But I, I have a hard time choosing between staying and, and bearing fruit or going. Verse 23, I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So he's got this, uh, this tension. He wants to be with Christ. He says, that is the best thing for me would be to leave this world and to be with him. But I know that it's important. I have a job left to do. Um, I have a task left to do. Uh, the Lord wants me to continue to bear fruit, so that's going to happen. But I still have this overarching, overwhelming desire to be with Christ. Um, and then in chapter 3, uh, along, along these lines, he talks about um, you know, his background and his pedigree and all these things that he accomplished as a Pharisee, as a, as a uh, close observer of the Jewish law. And yet he says, all these things that I've done, all these things that I've accomplished, they're worthless. All things... Um, what things were gained to me, these things I've counted loss for Christ. The things that I've accomplished are worthless. But in regards to knowing Christ, he says I count all things loss. Um, I'm, I'm pressing towards knowing him and being with him and being found in him. Um, and then in chapter 2, we, we see a, a beautiful description that I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, talking about the Lord Jesus and his, uh, his example, his humility, his servant um, uh, his, 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 uh, his position as a servant and ultimately his glorification the fact that all will 
bend the knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The book of Philippians is, is very full of practical instruction. And some of, um, some of Paul's, some of Paul's letters are, are very uh, doctrinal. Uh, they have a lot of rich doctrinal truth. And that, I would, would say, is true about Philippians as well. But Philippians has, has more of a practical uh, flavor, very, very practical for different ways that we should be living our lives. Um, he says in chapter 1, verse 27, uh, after he talks about the fact that he's going to stay for the benefit of these believers. In verse 27, he says, Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Are you, as you sit here this morning, are you saved? Have you been born again? Have you received salvation? Do you have eternal life? Um, if so, Paul writes, Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. The gospel is all about what Jesus did for us. It's his work, not ours. But if we receive the benefit of that, may our conduct be worthy of that investment, and worthy of that sacrifice that the Lord Jesus made on our behalf. Um, the, the book of Philippians contains uh, a number of practical instructions around the area of unity. Um, this section really starting in, in chapter 1, 27, through about halfway through chapter 2. Paul is instructing um, the believers to be humble. He's uh, instructing them to be um, selfless. He's uh, instructing them to not look at it for their own interests, but also the interests of others. And then sort of the pinnacle of that section, he says, let, let the mind that was in Christ, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This mind of humility, this mind of sacrifice, this mind of service. Um, in the midst of this book being very practical, um, he, he's, he doesn't shy away from the fact that even as believers, striving to live the life that we're intended to live, striving the life that Jesus intends for us to live, even as a born-again believer, we don't have in our own selves the strength to live the life we're supposed to live. But we have the Holy Spirit who gives us power, the ability to, uh, to, to live the life that we're supposed to live. Um, in chapter, chapter uh, 2, verses uh, 12... Sorry, verse 13. Well, verse 12. He says, uh, he says, I want you to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Having been saved, now it's time for you to walk the life of faith. But then verse 13, he says, it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. So there's a way that you're supposed to live. You're supposed to walk in obedience. But don't forget that it's God who's giving you the strength and giving you the ability and giving you the power to live that life. Uh, in chapter 3, he says that we are those who worship God in the spirit. We rejoice in Christ Jesus, and we have no confidence in the flesh. As a born-again believer, we don't have the strength in our own flesh to live the life we're supposed to live. But we do have the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Uh, throughout the book, Paul does not shy away from using his own life as an example. He points to his own life, and he says a number of times, follow my example. If you're mature, here's my mindset. If you're mature, you need to have that mindset as well. Now, um, you know, we could, we could ask, well, is, is Paul kind of being a little bit prideful here? Obviously, these are the words of Scripture, um, so he's not. Um, but he also writes in, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, he says, be imitators of, of us as we imitate Christ, right? I'm following Christ, he says. I'm imitating Christ, he says. So as you see that play out in my life, you can imitate that, but not because it's me, not, like, not because we're trying to be like Paul, but because we're trying to be like Christ. Um, and I think you could probably say, you know, going back to the idea that this, this letter is very personal. Paul has a very close connection with these believers. That probably allows him to be a little bit more open in terms of saying, hey, this, this is how I'm walking and following Christ. You guys need to follow that example. But as we think about that idea, Paul's life as an example, um, the question that I would pose to us this morning is, is my life, the way I'm living life, my Christian life, 
is it worthy of holding up as an example for others to follow? Not, not to bring glory to me, not to bring glory to you, but is the life that we're living, the life that you're living today, is it worthy of setting as an example for others who are younger in the faith? The last theme, uh, there's definitely a number of commendations that Paul gives um, on the tail end of chapter 2. He praises uh, his brother Timothy. He praises his brother in Christ Epaphroditus. And then uh, we even read sort of towards the end of chapter 4, his commendation for the Philippian believers themselves for their generosity. So um, we definitely see, again, along the lines of this being a positive and upbeat letter, Paul has a number of encouragements. Okay, in the remaining uh, minutes that we have this morning, let's go ahead and begin our study um, in verse-by-verse study of the book of uh, Philippians. And uh, we'll start with verses 1 through 6, which I'll go ahead and read. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always, in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful opening to uh, this letter to the Philippians. Just a few observations in the remaining minutes that we have. Um, look with me at the, at the very opening. Paul and Timothy, how does, he, how does he identify himself in the opening to this letter? We know that Paul is an apostle. He's an apostle. Uh, and in many of his, his letters, he identifies himself as an apostle. He carries a special amount of authority delegated to him by uh, the Lord Jesus. But in this letter, he identifies himself as a bondservant. The, the Greek word doulos, which can mean slave. He says, I'm a, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. I'm a voluntary servant of Jesus Christ. Um, we see other biblical writers identifying themselves in the same way. We see it in the book of James. We see it in the book of 2 Peter. We see it in the book of Jude. Indirectly, we see it in Revelation as John refers to himself as a servant. And even in chapter 2, we see the Lord Jesus taking upon him the form of of a servant, of a doulos. Is that how we identify ourselves this morning? We identify ourselves as someone who's born again, saved, headed for heaven, and living our life how we want to live it? Or will we identify ourselves as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Luke 9.23, he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus, if you're born again this morning, let us identify willingly as his servant, as his slave, uh, to obey his bidding and not uh, to follow our own plan. Let's continue. Uh, He writes in the second part of verse 1, he says, he's writing to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops or the elders and the deacons. So this letter is to um, all of the believers in Philippi, all of the saints in Christ Jesus. And uh, what a wonderful truth behind this phrase, saints in Christ Jesus. Those of us who have believed in the Lord Jesus, we have a new identity. We were lost. We were aliens. We were enemies of God. We were sinners. We were wicked and rebellious. But if you've put your faith in the Lord Jesus, you are identified as a saint. You are identified as being in Christ. Yes, we continue to struggle with sin and with messing up, but our identity, who we are, is no longer a sinner. That's not who I am. I am a saint in Christ Jesus. Not because of anything that we've done, but because we've been placed into Christ. 
based on his work on the cross. Verse 2, Paul issues uh, his standard greeting of grace and peace. Um, Grace and peace from who? From God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 3, I think, my God. And so we see these personal pronouns that that Paul is using in reference to the Lord. Um, When we come into a saving faith in the Lord Jesus, we now have a personal relationship with God. Personal relationship with the Father. And uh, we see that coming out in the expressions um, of Paul here in the opening to his letter. All right, let's look at verse 3 and 4. Verses 3, um, Paul introduces to the Philippian believers this idea that he is uh, thanking God for them. He is praying for them. And over the course of the next eight or nine verses through, I believe, the end of verse 11, he explains to them that he is praying for them. He's thanking God for them. He tells them the contents of his prayer for them. Um, but I'm always convicted when I read Paul's letters because it, it becomes abundantly clear that Paul was a man of prayer. Paul prayed a lot, apparently. He says, I'm praying for you how? In terms of frequency, how am I praying for you? He says, upon every remembrance of you, always, in every prayer of mine, That's how much he's praying for the Philippian believers. He's praying for them all the time, every time he thinks of them. And uh, this idea of remembrance, that that word there for remembrance, uh, I believe appears seven times in the New Testament. Every time, it comes from one of Paul's letters in reference to how often he prays uh, for his spiritual family in these other cities. Very convicting for me. Uh, He really lives out... Uh, the command that, w- that it was issued in, in 1 Thessalonians to pray without ceasing. And he does it in a way that is sacrificial, uh, a way that is uh, loving, and really a service to his brothers and sisters in these other cities. Um, very quickly in the last few minutes, the content of the prayer, um, as found in the f- these first few verses, which we're covering this morning, uh, he gives thanks for them, and he, he's praying for them. So what is, what is he giving thanks for? Um, verse Five, He's giving thanks for their fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And that fellowship, um, he's referencing their, their contributions, their, their financial contributions, which they're making to his ministry. That word fellowship uh, seems to be able to have maybe a dual meaning. It's definitely used elsewhere in the New Testament to refer to our relationship with Christ, our fellowship with him. Uh, Brother Adam read in 1 John this morning the fact that we have fellowship with God and fellowship with the Lord Jesus. Um, but there's, there's a number of instances where that word koinonia is used uh, clearly in the context of sharing um, in physical and financial ways. So he's thanking God that, uh, that the believers there in Philippi are generous with the, uh, with the financial prosperity with which God has blessed them. Um, and he even says, yeah, I'm thankful for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day. So apparently, not only are the Philippians generous, but even from the very beginning when he made that first visit, uh, resulting in the conversion of Lydia and the conversion of the Philippian jailer, apparently uh, these believers were concerned right away with uh, providing for for Paul's necessities, providing for the necessities of other believers in other areas who were less fortunate. Um, And so again, as we we continue to evaluate this this passage and think about it, um, and we look at our own lives, can it be said of us that we are generous? We, we live in, in um, you know, one of, one of the most financial prosperous uh, times, one of the most financial, financially prosperous areas, the, the United States of America. Uh, how are we using that, uh, that financial prosperity that the Lord's blessed us with um, in regards to being involved with the gospel mission? Um, I like how he says in verse 5, he's thankful for their fellowship in the gospel. And uh, the gospel is a powerful message that we must preach. It's a, po- it's a powerful message that must be heard, must be understood, must be received for someone to be born again. Romans 10 talks about faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The gospel is what Jesus did for us. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. He rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. So, of course, the question is, are we preaching the gospel? But as Paul refers to the gospel in this book, 
he seems to refer to it not only as a message, which it is, but he refers to it as a mission. He refers to his mission as the gospel. And I want to be really careful here because there, there is a, there's a false idea that's promoted by, um, by some perhaps genuine believers in, in the U.S. especially. But they'll tell you, well, what's really important is that you live your life in sort of a kind way and that your interactions with unbelievers, that you're really showing them the life of Jesus. It's not really important that you actually open your mouth and preach the gospel. It's, it's really about how you live. And um, it's, it's a half-truth, um, but it's also a half-non-truth. Uh, half uh, it's important for us to preach the gospel. It's also important to live it out. But Paul references uh, the gospel as a mission that he is on. A mission that he is on. Um, he talks again, verse, verse 12 in chapter 1, the things that have happened to me, my imprisonment, my suffering, have happened. They've actually furthered the gospel. And that's where his, his main concern is, is the furtherance of the gospel, this mission. Do we, do we view the gospel as a mission in our own lives to contribute to financially or to participate in individually? Lastly, we're out of time, but verse 6 is an amazing uh, uh, promise. Paul says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's talking about a good work that was begun in the Philippian believers by the Lord. The Lord is the one who began a good work in you, and I'm confident that he's going to bring it to completion, that he's going to finish it, that he's not going to leave it undone. Um, whatever, uh, whatever he intends, the Lord intends for us, he is going to see it through. So this good work that was begun in them, I believe that it's referring to their salvation. The good work that was begun in these believers that started at salvation when they placed their faith in Christ, when they were saved, when they were born again, when they were forgiven. It was a saving good work that was begun in them. But it was also a redemptive work. It was a transformational work. And so um, when we are saved, we begin a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but we also begin a new life. We're a new creation. And uh, he, we begin this process of transformation, this process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is confident that God is going to continue to work not only is he going to secure their salvation, and there's no, there's no risk of their salvation being lost, but he's confident that God is continue, going to continue to work in the lives of these believers in this work of sanctification, this work of transformation, this work of making their life uh, have a purpose and a meaning and a, uh, a bearing of fruit. He's confident that the Lord is going to bring this work to completion. So as we finish this morning... This final question that I'd like to, like to leave you with. First of all, has God begun the good work in you? Has that good work had a start? Has it had a beginning? Or has he not yet begun that good work? Have you understood that as a sinner, you need the work of the Lord Jesus that he did on the cross? As a sinner who has fallen short, one who cannot measure up to God's perfect standard, like all of us have. Have you seen the Lord Jesus, his work on the cross? He died for your sins, he rose again. Have you trusted in him? Have you received the gift of eternal life? And for those of you who have, who have had this good work begun in you, as, you evaluate, as we evaluate our lives this morning, do we see God continuing that work? Do we see him transforming us, using us, working in our lives? Are we allowing him to do so? Are we allowing him to have his way? Are we identifying ourselves as his servant, his, his, his slave? Um, are we active and passionate about the mission of the gospel? If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul is confident in this very thing, that he who has begun the good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We pray that uh, we're thankful for the, the good work that you've begun in each one of us here this morning. And we pray that as you continue that good work, that we would surrender to you, that we'd surrender to your lordship and allow you to continue to transform our lives, to continue to use us, help us to have the attitude that uh, to live as Christ and to die as gain. Pray that we would not fear, that we keep our eyes on you. 
And we just pray that as we continue this study in Philippians, that you would use it to change us, to transform us, and to make us more like the Lord Jesus. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.